Good morning. Bit ironic, isn't it, really, when I'm doing the recording? I thought I'd do a quick Q&A because why not? I've had a few questions and I'd like to share the answers with everybody. So when I did my chipping video, just 40 yards down there, I was talking about opening the face of my sand wedge. And my good friend Neil, who I played with, how long ago is it now, Neil? Is it three years? I can't remember. I'm getting old, I can't remember anything. He said he, he, he can't play with an open face sand wedge and he'll stick to chipping with a square club face. So I thought I'd better show you what I mean by an open face sand wedge with the aid of this patio and a straight line. So this is my sand wedge and a straight line if I can hold my phone. So that's square and that's what I call open. I've just added a tiny amount of loft. I'm most certainly not talking about a flop shot where you open it wide. I'm talking about that. Just that little tweak, that tiny little movement. So as you see, when I talk about an open club face, I'm talking about a tiny amount. When you open this face a tiny amount, you just add a tiny amount of bounce to the bottom there. I'm certainly not talking about laying this club flat and playing a flop shot. The flop shot is the shot of absolute last resort. Because this club face is flat like this, then the contact with the ball is very undeterminate, indeterminate, whatever the correct. What I'm basically saying is, is you cannot guarantee a good contact with the ball when you open this face up for a flop shot. So you can flop it in the bunker. You can flop it where the ball just goes and disappears into the rough, can't you? Or you can get too much ball and fly the green. Or if you blade it, then you're scattering everybody on the next tee box, aren't you? So the opening this face this wide is the place of last resort. You'd only do it if you really, really couldn't find a way of hitting the ball with a square of face and less loft. Now, while I was at it, uh, somebody asked me what wedges I used. And I said, oh, 2018, but I'll give you the model number. These are Mizuno T7s. I've got a 50, and this, my sand wedge, is a 55 with nine degrees of bounce. And the reason why I have less than your standard 13, 14 degrees of bounce is all the golf courses in this area that I play at are clay, which go very hard in the summer. And you don't want a lot of bounce when the ground is rock hard. In addition to that, sand in bunkers. You know, money is really tight for golf clubs at the moment. And the one thing that they neglect first the first thing that they neglect to do is fill up bunkers with the correct depth of sand. So you're always playing bunkers which have got barely any sand in them and you're, you're hitting into a hard base. So you want a little less bounce for that. Another question I got is, put that down. Have I joined the Herefordshire? And I answered no, which was truthful at the time. I am now a member of the Herefordshire. Thanks to the golf manager and the pro James, who's just giving a lesson down there on the putting green, probably uh, bending his ear. I am now a member of the Herefordshire. I've been given country membership for a year because I live about an hour and a quarter away which entitles me to play for free uh, to enter competitions my handicap is now held here although we're having some issues with the uh, with the England golf transferring my information to the intelligent golf system that they use here. They, they don't use how did I do, they use intelligence golf. 
and um, we're having a few issues. I've still got my membership at West Monmouthshire. Why haven't I been there? Well, quite simply, the because of the altitude above sea level, the growing season, the grass growing season, is always about a month behind the courses in the valley. So whereas the courses in the valley are hollow tining greens and dressing them the first week of April, up there at that altitude they do it the first week of May. Now that goes for if you travel further north. If, you, if I was to go to Manchester or the Yorkshire Dales, even though it's only 150, 160 miles north of here, the growing season again is it's later in the spring and autumn comes earlier. Their season is two months shorter than down here in the southwest. So if I go and play the course that uh, my dad was a member of up in Manchester, they don't do uh, their, their spring maintenance on the greens until May. So I will be getting to West Mon, just we let those greens recover and then I'll be up there. And if I get a day like this with no wind, and I, which means I can use the camera, then I'll definitely be going up there. Now, I've had a few rangefinders done videos on them poorly. I'll grant you, I'm, I'm no presenter, I can't do those sort of videos. Someone asked me, how many of these rangefinders have you got now? Well, I've only got my own. You see, I've given all those away. All the ones that I've had to test, I've given away. You know, the first one I got, I, and I, I wrote back to the company and I said, where do I send this back to? And they said, well, it's second hand now, so you might as well keep it. And when you think about it, you know, what is the cost of making a 120 pound rangefinder? It probably only costs them seven or eight quid per unit to actually make it. So it's not like they're giving me a small fortune. They're only giving me something that cost them seven or eight pounds plus whatever it costs to post it to me. Now the rangefinders I've had, they're all more or less in the same price range. Some are a fraction quicker than others. Um, they all do what they what they say they're going to do. This one's mine. This is the Inesis 900. It's about 128 pound retail now. Um, it's small fits in the hand well. Sometimes it takes a couple of goes to pick up a flag when you're 200 yards out. It buzzes in your hand when it does. You can switch it from yards to meters. You pull that little slider out, then you've got your slope rating. Um, it's got good magnification for my old eyes. I saw no reason to throw this away or give this one away and um, keep one of the ones I'd been given. Same with the uh, those iron head covers. Uh, I'm giving those away. Uh, and not because they're rubbish, but because they're good. You know, you don't give your mates rubbish, do you? You give your mates good stuff. I thought, that's good. Does anybody want these? Hand came up, yeah, I'll have them. So I'm giving them to a mate. When I see him on, um, I think it's the 7th of June all being well. Now I had a new company, I would never heard of them before. They contacted me, would you like to test a rangefinder and how much do you charge for a paid promotion? You know, for me to actually do more than just a six or seven minute video, but to do constant videos, you know, like going around and playing 18 holes and, and pushing the rangefinder on every single hole. Well, I said, um, I don't get many views. Are you sure you want to do this with me? And um, secondly, I've never had a paid promotion. I got no idea. Can you tell me what the going rate is for paid promotion? Well, I never had a reply. So they, uh, they always send an email saying, oh, we've been watching your videos for a long time and we would like you to do this for us. Well, it's quite obvious they don't watch your videos. Because if they watched my videos, they would see that I get so few views that it wasn't worth sending me the email. 
it wasn't worth the electricity to send me the email. What is the going rate for a paid promotion? I mean, there's, there's a guy on YouTube, every month he's got a different rangefinder with, you know, you get that paid promotion thing pop up on, on the top of the screen. I wonder what he charges. A thousand? A thousand pound to go? Five hundred pound to go? He certainly is not doing it for, for fifty pound to go, is he? So, um, I don't know. They didn't come back to me, so I don't need to worry about it. Now, it's at this point that I always forget something because I didn't write it down, or if I did write it down, I left it at home. So, I'll leave it there unless I can remember what it is and I'll tack it on the end. Cheerio. Right, I've just remembered. The chipping video. Let's go back to that briefly. Several years ago, I was, um, I did a video. It was about hitting a ball low out of trees. It was only a short video, but I got a comment on that saying, you are not a golf pro, you should not be attempting to teach people what to do. And he's right, I'm not a golf pro. I'm not very good at conveying information. What's going on in my brain is very difficult for me to turn into actual words that are meaningful. So the one thing I do in my chipping videos is I tell you what I do. So I use a club for coming up and over a bunker and I use a club for running out. And I tell you what those two clubs are. And one of the main reasons why I only use two clubs is that means I've only got to practice two clubs. I don't have to practice half the bag if I'm using six, seven irons and eight irons and what have you. And I just use two clubs because that's eas the easiest thing for me. But whilst I'll tell you what I do, I won't tell you what to do. I'll tell you what club I'm using, and tell you whether I've got the ball forward, middle or back. But I won't tell you what to do. Uh, I think there was a comment, somebody said, well, I use a 52 and a 9-iron. Brilliant. Nothing wrong with that at all. Someone else, I think, said, well, if there's nothing between me and the flag, I will putt from 20 yards off the green. Superb, do it. I can't do that because I don't practice it. I'm, if I was to go walk down here now with my putter and a couple of balls and get, walk back 20 yards from the front edge of the green and try and putt it, I'd be hopeless. I'd have one that came up short of the green and the next one I'd hit harder and it'd be off the back of the green because I don't practice it. I'd never tell you not to use your hybrid. A lot of people use hybrids. Coming up a slope that is cut to fairway height, uh, there was an old guy um, that I used to play with. Uh, when I say old, poor chap is um, under the ground now. He, he was a good 35 years older than me. He used to chip with a five iron and we were at Sirencester, par three, came up short, there's two bunkers, there's a bank up onto the green. He took out his five iron and he just rolled it between the two bunkers up onto the green, two and a half feet par. And I realised then that I knew absolutely nothing about the short game. When you play 18 holes with a gentleman like that who is chipping with a, a five or a six iron and knocking it close, you, you realize that you've still got an awful lot to learn. And I would never tell him, oh, you must use a sand wedge. So yeah, I do tell you what I do, but apart from using a 60 or a 64 or laying the club flat and flopping it, I will not tell you not to do something. But I still will say you need a club for going up or over and you need a club for running out. And if you only use two clubs, that means you've only got two clubs to practice, isn't it? So that's the end of this video, now that I remembered that bit. Cheerio.